hear from uh, the question that I was going to go to, Professor Michael Barber. Thank you, Michael Barber from Flinders University. I'm not sure that we've got that mic turned on there. It is now. It is now. Okay, we've got it on now. Go ahead. It's on, I think. As someone commented, this, of course, is not the first um, plant closure we've seen in South Australia in the last little while. Down in the south, uh, Mitsubishi closed. Sort of no, can, can everyone hear Michael out there? Closed six years ago, and as a response of that has been the Tonsley development. So I have two questions related to that to the panel. Firstly, do you think the sort of hub-type development that's been contemplated and planned between industry, government, and uh, universities around Tonsley is part of our solution? And if it is, is there a risk that here in South Australia we may actually give Tonsley a low death rate because we focus too much on the north? So how do we in fact deal with the north-south uh, divide in uh, our state and our response? Okay, um, Colm, we haven't heard from you. Do you want to uh, address that issue? Thanks for that question. Um, what I'm going to do actually in a moment is bring in a video we have on Tonsley, but just go ahead and get someone to talk about it for a little while and then we'll come to the video. We'll, well, we'll I, I have drive been, discussion. I have been down to Tonsley and I have seen uh, the transformation that has taken place there and it goes back to an earlier question and that is what is the role of government? And, um, and it goes actually right back to the first question that Jeff Knight asked. And I, I don't think we're at a situation now where we can't have a, we absolutely need a multifaceted response to Holden and what's happened most recently yesterday. And government having a role in stimulus like Tonsley, we're going to require an equal type stimulus for what we're seeing in manufacturing generally. And the perspective that I have on it is that you can't have the government um, providing incentives and grants to the value of $400 million per year to the car industry and then suddenly withdrawing it and expecting industry to transition. And uh, what I mean by that is that um, we do have a manufacturing future here, but there will be a role for government, whether it be in providing capital uh, to allow the expansion of things like Tonsley or to assist in some form of collateral for the things that Frank's talking about, but there is absolutely a role going forward. You just can't withdraw that kind of stimulus uh, from our economy, given where we're at. We're at 6.5% unemployment. Uh, we've got stagnant economic growth. Our population growth is almost at a standstill. And yes, I, I totally understand we've got to look at overseas um, centres and how they've transformed, but we've also got to understand what our economy our local economy is doing and what it's dependent on. So a large part of our employment is um, in the construction space, it's manufacturing, it's services and health, and a large part of South Australian income is dependent on sales to other Australians. So there's, a, there's an export content there that's missing. So um, I think it's a, a very complex answer to your, to your situation, but I think it's a combined response between being very clear what we want to do with government and um, business intervention, um, but also uh, the broader policy settings to actually get uh, people here that we want to, uh, to employ and have that skilled labour. Okay, let's test our uh, technology. I called for the Tonsley video. It's only a couple of minutes long, but it's well worth looking at to, uh, before we bring in the other panellists. Can we have a look at the Tonsley, Tonsley video? Tonsley is a key pillar of the uh, manufacturing work strategy for Demarcia. It's really one of those key elements in removing the infrastructure and policy gaps for business. Tonsley will be a real, real mixed-use, vibrant community. And it will be a place where businesses come together, businesses of all scales, so from your lead customers to your smaller startup enterprises. So health and medical devices is a real focus. We have a strong competitive and comparative advantage in that, so we leverage that. Green building services and technologies, also very important, as well as mining service su support industry. Of course, the collaboration extends then to researchers and students and, and the broader southern suburbs business community. Computer science and engineering is the primary focus of Flinders University's first stage investment on site at Tonsley. That's a really important injection to the site because it's a clear focus on the STEM subject area. So science, technology, engineering and maths. That's really important to businesses looking to invest in technology, innovation. That engineering capability is very important. Manufacturing in the 21st century is not just about products and product delivery. It's about everything from research 
through to implementation, operations, management. So it's a whole it's a whole chain. This is about a new platform for advanced manufacturing in the state, but lots needs to happen around that for it to be the productive and attractive working environment we need it to be. And that's why this stitched together mixed use community for manufacturers at close proximity to the CBD is a really key offering. Okay, we've got Megan and Cliff uh, with us in the room, I believe, and uh, let's get a microphone to Megan so that we can actually bring her into the discussion. But I'd like to hear from Raymond first. How important is that initiative? Um, what is the potential? Um, I've read the blurb and people are talking about possibly building 6,000 jobs over 10 years. How feasible is that? And what does it require to actually make it happen? Oh, no, I think it's uh, very feasible and very exciting. And one of the things that Tunsley does really is uh, unlock the uh, relationship between business and university, which is one of the keys to uh, uh, ongoing innovation. Uh, universities, frankly, are notoriously difficult to work with, particularly if you come from industry or business. You kind of don't quite know which door to go through and what you find on the other side of it. And I think Tunsley is a wonderful example of creating a very friendly interface and, a whole ser uh, and bringing together the competencies of the university, the competencies of business, with uh, you know, a little bit of policy support from government to, uh, uh, to accelerate uh, businesses and to really help businesses scale up, which is, uh, you know, which is the challenge. So okay. I think it's great. Let's go down to, you've got a microphone there, Megan? Yep, I don't think it's on though. So uh, try talking again, we'll see if we can turn it on. No. Yes, there you go. Might get you to stand up so people can actually see you. There we, there you go. Thank you very much. Oh, they can't. <laughs> <laughs> she was. Possibly stand I know I've been singled out for that, but I won't comment on that. Oh, you were standing up. <laughs> no, no. Um, sorry about that. Um, small but perfectly formed person, please talk. <laughs> now, what I, I really want to know right now, from you is what can you actually produce out of this? What do you see coming from it? We heard a few ideas there. Is it, when you actually put together researchers from university who have all sorts of ideas and perhaps their research is pure research, not necessarily applied research, mm -hmm. how do you actually make this work so that manufacturers want to go in there, make these links with people working in universities and produce something at the end? Mm. I think there's a number of ways in which it can translate and a lot of it comes down to proximity and familiarity. You know, these kind of the, the research industry connections will happen when there's an, there's an interface, a lively interface in a, in a productive working environment. So I think it's about exposing businesses to talent as it emerges out of, emerges out of university. I think it's a matter of university researchers seeing the problems, problems that businesses are dealing with and, and building that sort of trusted relationship which means that they can tackle a problem together. So that's how one of the ways you can imagine, um, imagine what's actually happening. To a broader question though, I think the role for Tonsley, we mentioned Techport just earlier. Mm. Tonsley is really a response to an infrastructure gap. So it's really about saying, we need a different and a new operating environment for our manufacturers, people who need to attract and retain great people, people who need to get that connection to university and, and what the researchers can offer, as well as the PhDs and, and, and graduates coming straight out. So for me, there are a number of manifestations of how this government, university, business nexus might come together. But the real effort is around looking at investments like Tonsley as ways of addressing infrastructure gaps. Techport was one, common user facilities is one approach. This is another approach. It's saying what's the business environment that, that, uh, that manufacturers need in, in South Australia and how can government's role in procurement support that? Okay, well, sitting next to you, in fact, we asked the question, is Professor Michael Barber, who's made a considerable investment. Can I get you to stand up, Michael, and uh, address the issue that we were just talking about a moment ago, which is, uh, well, uh, university is notoriously difficult to work with, I think Raymond said, uh, and yet you're going to try and make this happen. Tell us how. Uh, I think uh, the answer is that traditionally we have been, and I think one of the important things is to find programs which allow that translation and conversation to occur. Uh, I think Tonsley for Flinders is a strategic commitment. We've put $120 million into this particular project. It will, in fact, transform the university. Well, we need, in a sense, several things to happen in the wider community. We need, in fact, innovative companies. I mean, Frank and I have been talking about models that actually work in other parts of the world. And government does play a role in that. And to put it bluntly, it plays a role with some money. 
But money to us is often given because we think we need the money. We need to focus it on how do we move forward jobs and opportunities. And so Frank sent me up to UC Davis to meet a company funded by the state of California in um, evaporative cool, in air conditioning cooling. Funded by the state of California, it's key performance indicators, jobs, industry response. And so we need programs like that supported by government, supported by um, industry, supported by universities, and very prepared to start talking to people about their problems. How do we help the next generation of smart technologies? I think we can do that. I've spent 10, 15 years thinking about innovation. I think Tonsley will, in 10 years' time, be an exemplar of what we can do in this state. But it takes a bit of bravery by everybody to take the time that it will take to come forth. But we need the conversations that Megan talks about. Yeah. We need to think carefully about our mix of disciplines, but we can make it happen. Just very briefly, uh, before I, uh, I go to Frank, actually, because I'd like to get him to respond to what you just said and see what business thinks about this idea. But um, can you just tell us, are you going to change the way you do research? Does that mean you're going to now look at research in a way to think about its commercial applications more than you ever did before? Yes, there are people that will do that. I mean, Karen Reynolds at Flinders already does that. Talks to medical device people, talks to clinicians, thinks about their problems, puts their students into those problems. We have examples across the board of that we go. So it's wrong to think we're all sitting in ivory towers, but we need to find those programs which enable those people to get out, to have those conversations. And yes, we in the universities have to recognize that solving one of Frank's problems down on the production line at, at um, Nolunga is as challenging it is to write a paper for Nature in those journals. Yes, there is a challenge in universities in that, and I believe the best in the universities recognize it, and we can make that transformation. OK, well, I'm going to go to Frank, um, because you've been mentioned. Now, uh, obviously, it's not going to work unless uh, business puts capital into it and starts building things based on the research, et cetera, et cetera. This could be a long-term project, obviously, but th there's a lot of vision there. Um, do you think business generally will support that vision? There's been a few investments. Siemens, I think, have invested uh, some money in there. Some of the mining companies have invested some money in the project so far. But to, to date, it's small scale to really replace the missing jobs from the manufacturing industry, this is uh, from the automobile manufacturing industry, it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of effort. Now, Tony, I'm 72 years old, and uh, you asked the question at the beginning of what you said, and I don't quite remember what it was. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think business will, well, you're sort of responding to the Tonsley proposals, obviously. Do you think business generally will get on board? Do you think there is the will to do that? I think business should get on board. Business traditionally, we've spoken about the problem with universities. The problem with business over the years has been that they've said, well, they're only academics, we don't want to become involved with them. And I have had to do a, three, uh, a 180 degree turn, and our company has. And somebody said to me many years ago, if you're, if you're absolutely sure that it won't work, then you're absolutely right. And quite frankly, I'm absolutely sure that this can work. But there is a degree of risk in it. But for people in business, they're taking risk every day of their life, if they're doing anything worthwhile. And therefore, it's simply a matter of saying, opening their minds to the possibility, if not the probability, at least the possibility, that this could be made to work. And we are very excited about it, and we will. Yeah, OK, um, both of my panellists here want to get in on this. Con, briefly, because we've got we're, the whole panel to respond. I mean, the, um, the point that uh, resounded with me this morning was driving in and uh, listening to the radio, and um, an automotive supply chain manufacturer rang up and made a very profound comment. And they said, this is with the closure of um, mm -hmm. Toyota yesterday, and he said, who's going to tell me what to make? And it indicated to me that there is a very significant reliance on a particular sector, obviously. But it also indicated to me a real lack of thinking, innovation and leadership. Mm. The majority of our businesses in South Australia are SME. The majority of a gross state product is SME related, up to 70%. A key issue, and you see some leaders around the table, a key issue is leadership in business. 
And um, that is innovation in itself. And a lot of family businesses are operated by families. And they appoint boards and they appoint executives, but some don't. And there is a critical issue, I think there's a major turning point right now, about what these businesses, how they're going to respond to these, I think, are mammoth challenges that are going to be hitting the South Australian economy. But that's a positive, because at no point in time have I heard such passion from the business sector as I heard about the Crows wearing the state Guernsey last week. <laughs> yeah. um, there was absolute community alignment one way or the other, and that's what we need for South Australia. We need to get focused on economic growth. Greg Combe. Well, as a, I've spent a lot of time in public policy making, and after all that experience, and particularly working as, as an industry minister in the federal government, I'm convinced that this is the frontier that we as a community have to break through. That is to build effective collaboration between business and our research institutions the universities, the CSIRO and many others. I've had the privilege of going to numerous workplaces, having a look at so many businesses uh, in different industries and different states. Lots of capacity there, but there is a kind of cultural blockage to working with research institutions. And I've also had the, the privilege of going through a lot of the universities and having responsibility for the DSTO and the CSIRO at different stages as a minister. Um, there's also, I think, a bit of a cultural blockage, and I don't mean to be absolute about it, there's many exceptions to this, but a bit of a cultural blockage to working effectively with business. And one thing I realised is that the policy settings that governments make don't necessarily encourage it or forge that collaboration. So one of the things that uh, we posited, in fact, about exactly about 12 months ago in government was to redirect some of our research funding uh, away from pure research into applied research which was business-led, where business um, had a role of going to the research organisations and saying, this is what we need to solve. This is the nut we need to crack in order to be able to commercialise this technology. Can you help us? And I can tell you, it was a pretty hard thing to pull off. Um, the funding is still there and the policy settings are still there and I hope the new federal government acts upon it but I had the opportunity of seeing how important this could be. So I think Tonsley's a tremendous initiative would not have happened without the state government, without governments intervening to try and address this issue and get settings right to bring people together. Um, and it won't happen unless as a community in the business world, in the university world and in government, we make the decisions to make it happen. And I think it's crucial to us and crucial to the future of the manufacturing sector. All right, let's test um, with our, yes, let's test the market. Uh, David, what do you think? I mean, Tomsey I'm not totally familiar with, but if it does open up an opportunity for industry to engage with university in the right, in the right way, where the university personnel are motivated by innovation, outcomes, commercialization, jobs, rather than getting published, and are incentivized to do that, and, and that means they have to be recognized within their own construct, within the university construct, and rewarded for that. I think it's great. Would you, uh, would, great. Would you I mean, think about your business obviously relies on technology. Would, it you, does. There must be technological solutions you need solved uh, for the different things. Would, would you go to Michael? Uh, Michael, grab a microphone. Um, would you go to Michael and <laughs> say, Michael, um, what can you do for us? Yeah. Here's our problem. Absolutely right. Let's and see, and let's fur see. further to that, yeah. if I look at some of the technologies we now enjoy and our real revenue earners for our business, they've started in exactly this way. Let's, let's hear from Michael. I mean, you must feel good to hear that. We've got a hand up at the back there, so we'll get a microphone <laughs> over to that gentleman to put his hand up at the back, but let's hear from Michael right now. I mean, yes, I think, I think the question also goes two ways. I think some of our best researchers, some of our PhD students, some of Tanya's PhD students, ought to be invited into BA labs. They should be invited into BA construction things. They should be taken down into Sealy, as we've took some of our students. That conversation needs to go on to, in fact, to get people interested. And I think there's, it, it has been a divide, but it's been a divide on both sides of that thing. And I do not think not only in South Australia, but in Australia, 
we can no longer afford to keep those two bits apart. And no. all of us have to step back a little bit before we actually make that step and go across that divide. Well, surely if we can bridge the divide between business and universities, we can bridge the divide between two different political parties. Let's see if that can happen. <laughs>